in the Old Testament about Jeremiah, an account that happened to him in Jeremiah 18. Jeremiah's writing, he said, the word of the Lord came to me saying, go down to the potter's house and I'm going to talk to you there. And Jeremiah says, so I went down to the potter's house and behold, he wrought a work on the wheel. And the vessel that he wrought of clay was marred in the hands of the potter. And I don't know about you, but sometimes life just feels like it's marred, like it crumples, like it's marred. And, and it says the vessel was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again, another vessel that seemed good to the potter to make it. And then the Lord began to speak to Jeremiah and he says, cannot I do with you as this potter? For as clay is in the potter's hands, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. And what had happened is that Israel had started to follow idols, and uh, instead of following their true love of the Lord, they started to get really off and worshiping other things, and, and their decisions had knocked their whole life out of balance because they weren't in, in sync with the Lord anymore. They weren't fulfilling the purpose that he had for them, which was their true destiny. And so they began to fall and crumple, and their lives began to fall apart. And God was speaking to them and saying, you know what, you're falling apart. But just like the potter, I can pick you up and I can make you new again. And it says he made another vessel. It wasn't the same one. So God, sometimes when our lives fall apart, he doesn't do the same thing that he did in the past. But he does a new thing. He makes another vessel. It seems good to him to make it. But he truly is a redeemer. He knows exactly how to put us back together. Always carries though. I feel like I'm there you go all right now you can hear it but I, I know that many of us feel stuck in that a wall and sometimes we feel like that that lump of clay and like there, there's no purpose and I, I want us to be able as we we talk about today that we see that that God is more than able in the midst of that to create something beautiful out of what might have been just a lump of clay that might have been hard and not pliable and uh, I pray that today that God's word is going to have a, a tremendous impact in our lives. Because it's not a matter of if you and I will ever get stuck or in a wall. It's a matter of when. And um, we're going to see that uh, in a few minutes. So let's, let's, let's bow our heads and begin with the word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we just... Father, we come because, Lord, we are broken. We come because, Lord, we, we're just dust and ash before you. And many times, Lord, Father, instead of us pressing in and journeying through the wall, Lord, Father, we get stuck at the wall. We're trapped at the wall. Father, we, we refuse, Lord, to, to press through, Lord, the confusion and the pain or the misery or the, Father, or the... Lord, the, the, the struggle that, that, that is required for us to get to the other side and, and realize, Lord, that in the midst of that, Lord, that is where there is rich blessing and purpose in you, Lord. And I don't know exactly what that looks like, Lord, but we, we have seen it time and time again. And so we, we pray, Lord, today that you would give us eyes to see you and ears to hear you like we never have before. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would come and you would bring just a, a, just a time of refreshing 
in our hearts, our minds, and in our very soul. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. You know, the Bible tells us that great heroes of the faith hit walls. David soaked his pillow with tears. Jeremiah was nicknamed the weeping prophet. Jesus was a man of sorrow, the scripture tells us. Even in modern times, uh, or late modern times, like Charles Spurgeon, the, the great 19th century British preacher, suffered from acute depression and oftentimes couldn't even get out of bed because he was so depressed. And what we've discovered, I believe, that nowadays our generation has little or no compassion for people who are broken vessels of clay and hit a wall. And for this reason is why we're continuing our study of the book Emotionally Healthy Spirituality by Pete Scazzaro, which is based on the great commandment to loving people on their worst day, which requires a radical, revolutionary discipleship process of daily, authentic living, which I am convinced is a pathway to transformation and renewal in God. And so we began by looking at Saul and the problem with emotionally unhealthy spirituality. Then the following week, we looked at David and the importance to know yourself so that you would know God deeply, profoundly, and intimately. Last week, we looked at Joseph and how he had to go back in order to go forward in God. And today, we're going to look at Abraham's journey of following God, not feelings. And how this is the key to blessing as he journeys through the walls that you and I and every human being will eventually face. Because God's loving purpose is to restore you and me back into the image of his son's full blessing. Now this is where we hit the wall. Because for that to occur, a death must occur as well. But that leads us to the resurrection. And to new life and to new birth. And to the restoration of all things. And it also, what occurs is that there begins an invasion of God into the most deep places of our soul. And this is what unleashes breakthrough. This is what unleashes victory in your life and in my life. And so as we, we examine today's passage of Scripture, we're going to unpack what I want to call three key traps at the wall in order for us to break free of them and to continue this journey, you and I, of rich blessing with God. So here, here are the three, what I call the three key traps that you and I will experience at the wall. The first trap is... Living for the wrong things. We're living for the wrong things. Second trap is that we're dying to the wrong things. And the third thing is how my level and your level of faith does not work. Three things, okay? Now, if you wouldn't mind, just turn with me to Genesis, and we're going to look at that. We're going to see these things out of Abraham's life. Abraham chapter 22, and we'll be reading from verse 1. And it says, Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, Here I am, he replied. Then God said, Take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah and sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on the mountain I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took, took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place 
in distance. He said to his servants, he, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, father, yes, my son. Abraham replied, the fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but there is, where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood, and then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on your boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in a the thicket he saw a ram caught in its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. And so Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. All right. Probably one of the most toughest passages of scripture to really kind of grab a hold, like what in the world is going on? And I, I want us to kind of take a moment. I want, I want to show you a, a diagram. There's a diagram called Stages of Faith. You can just kind of put that up for me. And I, I want you to just kind of, I'm going to use Abraham's life in this, this photo uh, with the stages of life. Um, yes, there it is. All right. And I, I, um, I would like to say that, that uh, and you'll see this in the book, and in the book, there is a, a natural progression of, of, of you and me experiencing and, and coming to God. And that's really kind of like the first step you're going to see. It's a life-changing awareness. You and I come to an awareness of who God is, whether through word or deed or, 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 or some type of event. You and I come to this place. And Abraham comes to this place, and he comes to this place because God calls him out. God says, Abram, I want you to go. I want you to leave your family, leave your house, and leave, leave everything you know, and I want you to go into a land that I'm going to give you, a promised land. And Abraham comes to a place of awareness of God. And he made a choice. Now, th this, this, I would say, would probably be one of his biggest walls. It's usually one of our biggest walls that you and I come to, a wall of faith. Because everything around us is telling us, no, you can't touch him, smell him, see him. Why would you believe in something that you can't touch, smell, or see? And Abraham comes, and he journeys through that wall, and he leaves his family. And you guys, that's not, this, that's not an easy thing. And then we see that through the discipleship, you see through the life of Abraham, he goes through all these places in his life. And so he leaves, he goes, he goes to the place where God had called him to go, and then when he enters that place, there's a famine going on. Another wall. Discipleship usually is probably one of the biggest walls you and I face. We want to come to a nice service and feel good and kind of leave here real nice. But then God gives us all his rules and commands and we go, oh, I just, I just want to, you know, just like make me feel good. Give me enough to get through the week. And though that's not an evil thing, it's really just a scrap. What God wants to offer you and me is a full blessing. But a lot of times what discipleship is, is like a famine. You're like, whoa, that means that. I, there are things in my life that got to change. And it's not because it has to change. It's because eventually you're going to want it to change. When you get through that wall. And then you get to kind of stage three where Abraham comes in and he's prospering now in the land and everything's kind of going and he's serving and like using your gifts and talents and those types of things. And, and then what ends up happening is all of a sudden a wall comes, a huge wall. Now him and Lot. Boom, a clashing. And you're thinking, what is this faith journey about? I mean, God, I got to leave my mother, my father, my, my security blanket. I got to leave everything. Then I, I, I go out and I do it. And then all of a sudden now I'm in a famine. 
There's an enemy out there of my soul who's looking to discourage and shame and guilt me. And then when I punch through that wall, I, now I come to this place, and now I, now I got problems with my family, and lots, Lot and I have to split up, and my heart is broken. And, and I want you to understand that every wall that he gets to and every wall that you and I go through, you're going to see is that God is, God is testing Abraham. But why is God testing Abraham? Does God not know what's going on in Abraham's heart? Does, does God not know his servant? Of course he does. The testing isn't for God. The testing is for us to be able to know what really is going on in our heart of hearts. What is really motivating us? Because what motivates us is really what's beneath the waterline. It's underneath. It's not the tip of the iceberg that's motivating. It's everything else. It's fear and the anxiety, the pain, the hurt, the violation, the loss, the grief, the sorrow. That is what's now motivating what's happening on the tip of the iceberg. And the reality is the majority of us, is not all of us, are blind to it. We're absolutely blind to what really is motivating. The Bible says that our own righteousness is filthy rags. Like, wow, what in the world is that? And so the testing is actually one of the best things God can do, what a loving God can do to you and to me, because this is what I've discovered in my own life. The image of God in me is broken. My sin, my rebellion, my disobedience, what, what, what I've accepted, the half-truths that I've accepted in life from culture, from family, that I've built my life on. I'm, I'm living for the wrong things. I'm dying to the wrong things. And every time I, went, I go take a step of faith, I realize that the level of faith at that moment is not enough to get me. And unless God takes me to another place, unless I get another revelation of the greatness of God and the goodness of God and the love of God and how deep and wide and, 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 and high is the love of God, I, I'm not going to be able to make it. I realize, and this is what I want you to understand about our faith, it's not a destination, it's a journey. In this life, it's a journey. We're going from glory to glory to glory to glory. We're coming into a deeper revelation of who God is. And through the study of the word and in prayer and, and, and times of silence and solitude, as we see Jesus going off to places to be in time with the Lord, we, we realize that, that I, I, I need more of him every day. I need him to, to fill me and, and, and to show me through the experiences. And so here, Abraham comes to this wall and I would say the most research tells us that the majority of believers are stuck at a wall. We're stuck at a wall because our faith and our understanding of God in the midst of that is not enough to get us to the other side. And so either we give up or because it's too painful, we tend to run away. And so, but the problem is or the struggle is that some of us, we stubbornly like, or I wouldn't say like, but we stubbornly get stuck in the same place, and then eventually we get comfortable there. We put ourselves on cruise control, and then we go through rules and rituals and ceremonies and traditions, and we say, well, that's just enough. And the reality is that that's, you and I were never meant to be satisfied with man-made rules, rituals, and ceremonies. You and I were only meant to be satisfied with the presence of a holy God who is in the business of restoring the broken image, the broken vessel, the, 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 the mound of clay that we are, and make a beautiful vessel, a trophy of grace that he is going to use for his glory. And the reality is that that takes you and me going through the furnace seven times to remove all the impurities. But the problem is that we hit a wall and we don't want to go forward. And so even if we do get through the wall... Then we go to what we call, when you and I, this is a rich blessing. When we get on the other side of the wall, what ends up happening is that all of a sudden we begin to, we begin to see, we get a worldview of God that we never had if we got stuck in the wall. In other words, that maybe, maybe our God was this big in the circumstance. And now when we get to the other side of the wall, he's this big. My faith grows. My understanding of the fact that, you know what, maybe this life isn't about Eddie. 
Maybe, maybe, maybe all of my possessions are not mine, like a two-year-old. Maybe God gave them to me, the steward. Maybe, maybe the bitterness and the anger and the, the, the unforgiveness that runs in me, well, maybe that is really what's hindering me. Maybe when I begin to experience the love of God for my own foolishness, I'm able then, on the other side of the wall, to be more gracious and more compassionate and more generous and more forgiving. And so then we go to the outward journey and we say, okay, Lord, what is in me that is hindering me? Why, why do I feel anger towards this person? Where before, I would just let it go. Well, that's, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just going to go to Saturday night service instead of Sunday so I don't have to see that person. <laughs> I'm walking through Walmart and see them. I go down the other aisle. And then say, hallelujah, God bless you, come to church. And really say, that, why am I angry? What is it beneath the waterline? What is it? What is it that that person did or said or reminds me of that is stirring up all this anger and being angry is not a sin. It says be angry but sin not. But my sinning is that now I have just minimized you and I'm violating your humanity and I'm not following what God's called me to do to love and be compassionate and forgiving. I'm holding on. And so what I'm saying is that there takes a, a, a time when you and I begin to start doing our own testing. God tests us to tell us that we need to be able to test our thoughts, our actions, and obedience under the Word of God. Where before, it was never an issue. And we grow in that. We, it's what the Bible calls maturity. We're maturing in the things of God, in the practice of God, in the character of God, in the holiness of God. And then we get to stage six, and it's all of a sudden, hey, you know what? I realize that maybe... Just maybe, God knows more than I do. And in the midst of that, I'm leaning into him to help me through my bitterness, through my unforgiveness, through my rage, through my bigotry, through my racism, that normally I just kind of cover over and just not deal with that on the tip of the iceberg. But I'm saying, you know what? Because of my, what, my, what my Jesus did for me on the cross, I'm unwilling to stay in that broken vessel stage. I'm going to allow God to mold me and shape me by his word, by prayer, by pursuing his presence. You see? Now, this isn't just a one end. We go through this cycle over and over and over again. And I, I want to just kind of quickly kind of go through it. Just turn with me back to Genesis chapter 2. I want you to see here in verse 1, it says God tested him, right? And because this is, what it, this is what the test always comes down to, pretty much. My will, God's will. God knows that the place of blessing and healing and restoration is in his will. The reality is, is that many of us think we're doing God's will, but it's really our will. And that's why the, the Bible constantly reminds you and me that it's necessary that you and I need to align our heart with the Father's heart. What wrecks his heart wrecks our heart. So how is that, how is that possible? Well, I realized the first thing, that when I hit a wall, the first testing I got to ask myself, because God's going to already ask you, am I living for the wrong things? And I realize, and I, 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 I feel a great connection here with Abraham. Because 15 years ago, God had asked Norm and I to pack up our family, leave our parents, leave our friends, leave the city that we grew up our entire life for, and then go off to this strange land called Florida. Now... It, wouldn't, it, wouldn't, it would be okay because, I mean, if I was just going to come down for a week and hang out and, you know, on the beach. But he's like, no, I was going to sell everything and, like, I had no idea whether I was going to ever come back again. And I'm telling you, I, woo, boy, that, I hit a 
the, I'm going to tell you exactly. I, I wish I was spiritual. But you got to understand, I had, we had just planted New Hope. Uh, new Hope. New Life, actually. <laughs> Other churches, New Life. And, and um, it was growing. It was, it was I mean, uh, God was doing some amazing things. We had families who sold their homes okay, moved out of the, the neighbors they were living and moved into the neighborhood that we were planting a church just to come alongside and plant with us. I mean, the level of commitment and friendship that we had was amazing. And so when God said it's time to move, I looked at him and go, oh, this must be bad pizza. This can't be God. There's no way. My level of faith was zero. I had no faith to move. In any shape or form. And I realized that the place that I was at, and I realized there was a whole bunch of other things that I was living for that God wanted me to address, and I was basically glazing them over. And the image of, and I'm thinking, hey, I mean, I'm, I'm preaching every week, we're doing evangelism, people getting saved, and the church is growing. It grew out of my basement, and we rented a place, and now we have over 100 people going, woohoo, success, whoopee. <laughs> what ended up happening was that I had to, God was telling me I had to let certain things go. The reality is that he, he led me into a real dark place. Because I tell the truth, I had no faith to move. And the reason why I had no faith to move is because I was living my life for certain things. And I'm going to say they weren't evil or bad things. They were good things. Sometimes we're living, living for the wrong things could be that you're living for good things that have become the ultimate thing in your life. The Bible has a word for that. It's called idolatry. And all of a sudden, now we take a good thing, we build our entire life, our self-esteem, our sense of worth and value around it, and then all of a sudden, we, God knows, your Heavenly Father knows that that cannot sustain you. It's a matter of time before you crash. It wasn't meant, there was nothing in this life that was meant to sustain you and support you. Only His Son He's the only foundation. He is the only rock that's going to be able to sustain you and me through the, through the trials and the, and the brokenness. And you say, well, what do you mean, Ed? Well, the reality is that every single one of us have experienced the wall. For some, it might be a divorce. For others, it might be a terrible sickness. It might be a loss of a loved one. It might be that, you know what, the your dream job, you just got laid off. And you're trying to figure out what in the world is going on. And our level of faith can't get us through the wall. I, this doesn't make any sense. I've been praying, I've been going to church, I've read the Bible, I've got all this stuff going on. Whoa. It could be a horrible church experience. Well, you've gotten hurt. And you hit a wall and you go, what? Those people, hypocrites, I'm out of here. <laughs> right? I've been there. I've been <laughs> guilty. Guilty, guilty. And we hit a wall. And see, I realized when God called me to move that ultimately that he wanted, he was, Eddie, you're, you are doing a whole bunch of stuff for the kingdom. But it's your will, not mine. Because you're doing for God is this huge, and your being with me is this little. And when it's that little, it's always my will, not his. And he loved me way too much to leave me in that condition. And the reality is that until I moved, I would have never seen it. You understand? And so you, we have to push through that wall. Or else we'll get stuck. And Abraham, we see, in each stage, he gets, there's a wall, and he presses through. And then, if you look uh, at the end of verse 2, God asks him, sacrifice, sacrifice him as a burnt offering. 
I mean, you're thinking, okay, come on, Lord, have I not given enough? Have I not sacrificed enough? Have I, have I not done all your will? Now this? How many of us have come to a place like that? How many have come and all of a sudden now we have more questions about God than answers? How many of us feel so dry inside and saying, I read and I pray and I go to church, but I am empty? And because we hit a wall. And I realized that when I got to Florida, that the reality was that Eddie was living for the praise of people more than the praise of my God. That I got more joy and more excitement about when people were paying a great job. And so I was over-functioning to please people. I was very driven for success. I, I, I'm going to be the best at this thing. And if I have to run you over to get there, then I will. In Jesus' name, pray for you. Say, Pastor. Yes. And I realized that I didn't realize in New York that not only was I living for the wrong things, I was dying to the wrong things. Because I was so busy being successful for God that I was dying to my relationship and my marriage. I was dying to intimacy with my children. I was dying to the wrong things. And I just kept on justifying. Well, this is for God. Suck it up, buttercup. Come on. Let's get it done. And ultimately, what ended up happening is when I got down here, I slammed into a wall. Because this is what I realized. I realized that the, the good things, I thought the good things that were, you know, were, were for me, ended up wrecking me. Norm and I, we, we, we were fully ingrained in New York. I had all these opportunities. I was running. I finally retired from the NYPD. I put all my energy into the ministry, and I ran. And if you weren't catching up, tough. Because this puppy's on the track, and we're moving. And God was like, enough of that. <laughs> and it's not because of him. It's because... I knew my daddy in heaven loved me. And he knew down the road, maybe 10, 15, 20 years from now, I'd probably be alone. Norma would probably have had enough. My kids would probably hate my guts and wouldn't want to even visit me on Father's Day. And I'm saying, I am not getting to the end of my life like that. And I cried. I, I hit a wall. I'm like, I, I don't know what to do. My level of faith, now I couldn't. I was dying to all these wrong things instead of what God was asking me to die for. To die for my unforgiveness. To die to my bitterness. To die to my rage. To die to my own bigotry. That he's called me to die to. But it's easier to die to the other things. And I realize that ultimately... It's the reason why I didn't rest, and the reason why I was over-functioning, the reason why I was so judgmental. Because if you weren't running as hard as me, then you weren't worthy of the kingdom. Get up. Get some real Christians in here. <laughs> Thank God you never met that guy. <laughs> Though there's still part of that that's still there. I'm just saying I'm not arrived, all right? But there are times. And I realized that God, God was preparing me, and he was also purging me. And that's the inward journey. See, this last verse in 8, I, I, Abraham, in verse 8, Abraham answered, it says, God himself will provide. You know, you know what blows my mind as we go, when I showed you that, that stage of faith, is that ultimately, you know, you think that once, you, once you've gone through a wall, that's it, you're done. Woohoo! I made it. I, I, I have countless walls I've hit. 
countless walls in my marriage, countless walls in my finances, countless walls of, of losing people, and the list goes on and on and on. And I figured, wow, okay, I believe God. I packed up my family, sold my house. We had no friends, no family, didn't know any, not one soul. Not one soul did we know when we moved down. And everybody thought I was a couple of french fries short of a Happy Meal. <laughs> what? What are you going down there? My own denomination. I can't, what, what are you doing here? You're not candidating for a church. I mean, you're, I'm, I'm, God told me to come, so I'm here. And they looked at me like, what? What is wrong with you? See, and then for three months, nothing happened. Three months. Zero. And I, Lord, now, now I'm afraid. For three months, I came down early, get, get, get the household painted up. Norma was still waiting for the kids to finish school. We ripped them out of, out of their schools. The, the, their, their parents, I mean, every friend I've ever made in life lived in New York. I didn't know anybody. And I'm sitting here going, I think I made the worst decision of my life. What did I just do? You know? And I got all this doubt and anxiety and fear now, and I'm like, oh my, and now I'm getting angry at God. You made me? I didn't want to come. <laughs> it's terrible, isn't it? That broken image in me is so messed up. And God patiently lovingly, Eddie, I got it, I got it, I got it. And so, by the grace of God and some miraculous things that I, I, I could, you could have never put together, God put them together, we end up kicking off New, new Hope in 04. And, um, oh, the story gets even lovelier. <laughs> but praise the Lord for His glory, right? We kicked off with a bang. I mean, it was amazing. First year we grew at 100, second year we're at 200. We had to move to another school. We had to then go to two services. We were at 300, third year, year three and a half, we're at 350. And I, woo, this thing is hot. And then the school board raised our rent 300%. So we had to go from $4,000 to $12,000 in rent. Basically threw us out. It was like a death for me. <laughs> what is what you, come on what is going on here see and the problem is, is that broken image in me I still had pieces I was bringing along and so we were growing and my little, work, my little, my little leadership team was worn out and exhausted they were burnt and I'm like let's, let's charge the hell let's do it for Jesus come on and I realized, boy, it's so easy to fall back into old patterns, man. And God loved me too much. I said, no, 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 Eddie. We're not going back. We're going forward. And would you be willing to offer new hope on the altar? Is it your church, Eddie, or is it mine? What does it matter if I don't allow it to grow? And again, I got a level of faith. I could, I, my theology did not work. I could, come on, God. I mean, you know, here's, and I quote 15 promises. <laughs> and it wouldn't work. It was working. God was just doing something else. And so I came in that day, I had a list of churches for people to go to and this and that, and I was broken. I mean, it was, I don't know what to do. And then God supernaturally opened up doors again. The minute I was willing, like Abraham, to kill it, he opened doors for us to buy these facilities. And I figured, woohoo! praise the Lord. Yeah, God is awesome. So we move into the facility and half the congregation leaves. My whole leadership team was like, oh, Eddie, we're done, man. You know how much work it is in this building? <laughs> I'm done. And so with half a congregation and a need for a whole new leadership team, now we had to go into a big building program and to move forward. And with a whole congregation now, 
was near a depression because all their friends left. And it was probably, I had two times in my life I ever wanted to quit. That was one. I was done. And I was angry. And I'm thinking, Lord, you, you, you brought me out this place to let me die in the desert? You ever heard that before? <laughs> and I realized that God, God was doing a work. And he's saying, Eddie, I need you to lean into me. You're leaning into your gifts. You're leaning into your energy. And I gave you those, okay? But that is not your anchor. That is not your foundation. You are not to, you are not to lean into those for success. You are to lean into me. And I realized that my level of faith where I was at was not going to be able to take New Hope to the place it needed to go unless something died inside. Because God wanted to bring a resurrection. And a resurrection of saying, it is not by might or by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And the workers are laboring in vain if the Lord is not building his house. And I don't know what circumstance you're going through, and I don't know what pain or sorrow or grief or just an impossible circumstance that you are in. And I know the natural tendency is to lean into our experience, our gifting, our knowledge, science, reasoning, education, whatever it may be. None of those things were meant to sustain you. And this is the reason why we're stuck at the wall. We have to lean into his presence. And my heart for you is that you would experience a God who is able in your marriage, in your finances, in your relationships, in the midst of your loss. Don't run from the pain. Don't run from the mystery. Don't run from the confusion. Lean on the only one, the only anchor, the only cornerstone, the only rock that's ever going to help you get through it. Don't run. Don't quit. Hold on to him. And this is why we come to communion. Probably, I think, the, the most awesome illustration ever that God has given us to remind us that we are to lean in, that we are to press in, that God has, it's a finished work. It's complete. It is done. And he's saying, yes, there is a death. There's a death that you and I are living in our bodies that has to go. John the Baptist, I believe, said it the best. He says, I need to decrease. There's, a, there's even a death in decreasing so that God may arise, that God may increase. He may increase in our righteousness. He may increase in our holiness. He may increase in our worship. But if we're fighting it, we stay on the other side of the wall, trapped. And God is looking to have a victory and a breakthrough. Let's all stand. I'm going to ask you to lean into God. I'm going to ask you to consider, you know whatever it may be. I don't know. It's time. It is time for you to stop running. It is time for you to stop quitting. It is time for you to press into God and allow him to finish the work he started. He who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it. And there's too many of us who've been running. We have not, our level of faith has not experienced a resurrection. And that's why we do this. We come to him and, okay, Lord, I'm going to trust you for the outcome. I don't feel it. Abraham didn't feel it. He was following God, not feeling it. We're going to, if you and I are waiting for feeling it, it's never going to happen. God never told you and me to follow our feelings. We follow the truth. And the truth is going to set us free. Now, we're doing something a little different here, so don't get nervous. <laughs> I'm just going to show you here. Realize we, we are being virus-friendly.
No. Not as antivirus friendly. <laughs> this is what we did with communion. There's two cups. One, and then the bread is inside. So everybody's not touching it, all right? Yeah, you like that. Come on. I wish it was my idea. It wasn't my idea. <laughs> I'm going to invite you to come to the, your Heavenly Father who loves you and adores you, who knows, who knows what you're going I might not understand all that you're going through, but I know my Heavenly Father does. I know Jesus endured the most horrific pain, suffering, sorrow, loss, rejection, abuse, violation, so that you and I would be able to to experience a resurrection and new life. And if that's where you are, I'm going to invite you to come. Just grab one, hold on to them, and then we'll close in prayer. Let's close with this song. So callous, now I can't feel. I want to run to you with heart wide open. Make me broken, make me empty so I can be filled. Cause I'm still holding on to my. come to that sacred moment where we say, Lord, we've been trying in our own way, my will, not your will. We're, we've been living for the wrong things and dying to the wrong things. And Lord, we've gotten comfortable at the level of faith that we're at and think that that's going to sustain us to the end. And the riches of your grace and the glory that you have laid out before us, Lord, we have set aside and I pray, Father, as we come, Lord, that we would make and renew our covenant with you. 
And whether for the very first time, Lord, or Father, we come back and we say, Lord, we are going to lean into you. We're going to allow you who began a good work in us to complete it. We are not going to allow ourselves to continue to stay at the foot of the wall and not grow and not allow you to be able to, to bring out all those things that are hindering us. And so we're going to trust you for that. So let's take his body and his blood together. Father, I thank you, Lord, for all my brothers and sisters here. I thank you for the grace. I thank you for your mercy. I pray, Lord, that you would not let any one of us, Lord, leave this place without an encounter with you, without a breakthrough with you, Lord, that's going to lead us and help us journey through this wall. We ask you, Lord, and thank you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys and have an awesome, awesome day. Woohoo! All right.